12 part, 12 hour documentary film series which aired on the Showtime Network in the United States and all around the world called The Untold History of the United States. Some of you may have seen it. Uh, I wrote that with the filmmaker Oliver Stone. And uh, the book is out in 15 or 16 different languages now, so it's gotten a lot of visibility. And we, we decided to do this project because we were very concerned with the lack of historical knowledge and understanding and how dangerous we knew that to be. The United States is especially the case as the world's only remaining superpower with the force to wipe out life on this planet many times over. The ignorance in the United States about history was very troubling to us. In 2011, the United States issued a national report card and it showed that American high school seniors came in lowest, not in math and science, which we're always complaining about, but in U.S. history. Only 12% of high school seniors in the United States were judged to be proficient in U.S. history. And I find this to be the case wherever I travel. Uh, this is the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. Americans believe three fundamental myths about World War II. The first myth is that the United States won the war in Europe. The reality, of course, is that for most of the war, the United States and the British confronted 10 Nazi div German divisions combined, while the Soviet Union was confronting 200 German divisions. The United States war narrative begins with D-Day. It starts with, uh, with Pearl Harbor, then we take a hiatus, then it starts again really with D-Day on June 6, 1944. It's a very, very different narrative, certainly, than the Soviets had about World War II. The, uh, as Churchill said, it was the Soviet <coughs> army that tore the guts out of the German war machine. The United States lost about 300,000 people in combat, 400,000 overall. The Soviets lost 27 million, uh, which is the equivalent. You think in the United States how the country freaked out over 9-11. The Soviet loss in World War II is the equivalent of 1-9-11 occurring every day for 24 years. As John Kennedy said, said it's the equivalent of the entire United States east of Chicago having been wiped out. And Americans don't know that. I, took, I did an anonymous survey of, of students, not history students, but other students, and I asked them how many Americans died in World War II. The median answer was about 90,000. I asked them how many Soviets died in World War II. The median answer was about 100,000. So they were off by 300,000 on Americans. They were off by 27 million when it came to the Soviets. These kids cannot possibly understand the Cold War. They cannot possibly understand what's going on in Ukraine now. They have no basic knowledge about this history. The second myth is that the Cold War started during World War II because of Soviet aggression and territorial aggrandizement. I won't have time to go into that now, but I would love to talk about it. But the third myth, which I will talk about, is that the atomic bomb ended the war in the Pacific. The Americans' knowledge about the atomic bomb is, is quite limited. And that's the case in much of the world now. Uh, about, the, the surveys show that about 35% of American youth don't know that Hiroshima was the target of the first bomb, and about equivalent equivalent percentage of Japanese youth also don't know that Hiroshima was the target of the first bomb. So there's been this process of, of sanitizing this, this history. But Oliver Stone and I were going to initially start, the, this, our episode about the decision to drop the bomb was going to be our first episode, because we think that's so pivotal for understanding anything about American history or about what's happened in the world since then. So I'm going to focus on that today. The topic was the nuclear age, uh, which seemed much too big. So I'm going to focus more narrowly on the decision to drop the bomb, the consequences, the significance. My students sit through a 12-hour lecture on this topic. I don't have that much time today. So I'm going to try to telescope it and narrow it. Uh, I'm going to have to throw some names at you, uh, but uh, I hope that's not a problem. But let me begin with a statement made by Lewis Mumford, a very important social critic. In 1946, he wrote an editorial in Saturday Review, in which, uh, which uh, titled, Gentlemen, You Are Bad. 
This was right after the bikini test. And he said, we are living among madmen. Madmen govern our affairs in the name of order and security. The chief madmen claim the titles of general, admiral, senator, scientist, administrator, secretary of state, even president. And the fatal symptom of that madness is that they have been carrying through a series of acts which will lead eventually to the destruction of mankind under the solemn conviction that they are normal, responsible people, living sane lives and working for reasonable ends. Soberly, day by day, this madness continues to go through the undeviating motions of madness, motions so stereotyped, so commonplace, that they seem the normal motions of normal men, not the mass compulsions of people bent on total death. And that's what we've been dealing with throughout the nuclear age. Madmen, people who are planning for our species annihilation and extinction under the guise of trying to prevent it. And the madness continued throughout, throughout the nuclear age. Uh, I remember the first time I went to the A-bomb museum in Hiroshima, and I saw uh, one of these signs said that by 1985, the world had accumulated the equivalent of 1.47 million Hiroshima bombs. What did we need 1.47 million Hiroshima bombs for? What do we need over 70,000 of those weapons for? The destructive capability of 1.47 million Hiroshima bombs. Uh, in fact, I think the epitome of the madness came in 1954 when the United States was seriously considering something called Project Sundial. And that was to make a, a 10,000 megaton bomb. There were congressional hearings in 1954 led by top scientists discussing the capability of producing a 10,000 megaton bomb. For anybody who doesn't know what that means, that's a bomb 700,000 times the size of the bomb that wiped out Hiroshima. 700,000 times. And this is, as John Kennedy said uh, in 1961 when he was given a briefing about America's <coughs> war plans, he commented to Dean Rusty, he said, and we call ourselves a human race. I mean, th this is the, the kind of insanity we've been dealing with throughout the nuclear age. So I'm going to tell you more today about how it started, because the way it started is going to shape the way it proceeded throughout the coming period. There are three basic narratives about the decision to drop the bomb. The first is the heroic or triumphal narrative. And that's the one that American school children learn. And that argues that the atomic bomb was necessary. World War II for the United States was the good war, that the Americans were on the side of the gods, fighting against Japanese militarism and, and German fascism, Italian fascism. And the United States dropped the bomb because they wanted to avoid an invasion. The Japanese were so fanatic that they were going to never surrender, that the only way the United States could win the war was by an invasion that was planned to begin in November. And in order to avoid the invasion in November, we dropped the bombs in, on August 6th and August 9th. So, and then, Truman says that General Marshall told him we would have lost a half million men in invasion. The numbers vary over the years. Truman starts off saying we lost thousands of men. We would have lost thousands of men. Then he raises it to a quarter of a million men. Then he raises it to a half million men. He later says a million men. And George H.W. Bush said the Americans would have lost millions of men in an invasion. So that's part of the mythology, and that's the heroic narrative. So we, we dropped the bomb because we were the good guys, and we had to do it to save that hundreds of thousands of American lives. And then later we say about all the Japanese lives who were also saved. The second narrative is the tragic narrative. And the tragic narrative argues that the atomic bombings were a tragedy because there were other ways to force Japanese surrender. Hundreds of thousands of innocent Japanese women and children were killed. And many, many more were injured and suffered their entire lives. So from that standpoint, there was a tragedy. The third narrative, which I have proposed, is what I call the apocalyptic narrative. And that's a much, much harder condemnation of Truman. And what I'm arguing is that Truman knew and actually understood that he was beginning a process that could end all life on the planet. To kill hundreds of thousands of people, innocent civilians, is a war crime. To threaten the extinction of our entire species and all other life on the planet is far, far worse. And that's what Truman knew before he started. He knew there were other ways to end the war. He knew the Japanese knew they were defeated and trying to surrender. And yet he went ahead and used the atomic bomb in the most reckless way. And it's that attitude which we see repeated over and over again 
a kind of recklessness in the hands of very, very limited human beings who've got this limited morality in many cases, but this enormous technological military power and, and that, that, that faces our, that still confronts our species with the threat of annihilation. So I want to give you some background so you know why I'm saying that the atomic bombs were not necessary, morally reprehensible, that American military leaders said so at the time, American scientists said so at the time, and Truman knew that at the time. The story begins really in night, early 1939, when uh, Americans learned that the Germans had split the uranium atom. The, uh, at that point, the American military was not interested in looking into nuclear research. It was the emigre scientists who had escaped from Nazi-occupied Europe who tried to press the American leaders to, the, to begin nuclear bomb research. They knew and they feared what would happen if Hitler got a bomb. They knew that Germany had the scientific, technological capability of developing a bomb, and they feared that Germany would go ahead and do so. So they finally got to Einstein and wrote the letter to Roosevelt to convince the United States to begin the bomb project. And that was in early 1939, but it was started as a deterrent. They thought this would be a deterrent against the possible German bomb. There was never any idea of using bomb against Japan in the beginning. And America's strategy for ending the war required uh, uh, aerial bombardment, a naval blockade, and the invasion. So the question was, was the United States really going to invade Japan? And the reality there is that the United States was, had no intention and no need for invading Japan. We dropped the bomb on August 6th and 9th for an invasion that's supposed to begin on November 1st. The main part of the invasion was not going to begin until March of the following year. So we're going to start in Kyushu and then work our way finally to Honshu, the main Japanese mainland, uh, not, not until the next March, 1946. So we dropped the bomb, though, in August of 1945. The Japanese were already militarily defeated. In fact, beginning with the Battle of Saipan in July 1944, the Japanese recognized they had no hope of victory. Uh, and they began at that point planning for how they could end the war. On February, on February 14th, 1945, former Prime Minister Kanoe writes a memo to Emperor Hirohito in which he says, I regret to say that defeat is inevitable. What we have to worry about is not defeat, it is a communist revolution. But the, if you look at the proceedings in the Japanese cabinet, the war cabinet, what they were discussing was the danger of what would happen if the Soviets invaded. They said in Eastern Europe, when the Soviets invaded, they were greeted as liberators, and the same thing would happen in Japan. The Japanese people were very war-weary, very angry about the war by that point, and had had enough. So that was the fear. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about, that, about the Japanese defeat. The Japanese Navy had already been destroyed. The Air Force was effectively destroyed at that point. The Army was tied down. So the, the, the Japanese knew they were defeated. And in fact, the Americans knew that also. How did the Americans know? The Americans had been intercepting Japanese cables. Americans had broken the code at the start of the war. They had been intercepting Japanese cables. And the cable traffic was very, very consistent. And it said that, uh, that the only obstacle to Japanese surrender is the American demand for unconditional surrender. Why was that such a troubling thing for the Japanese? Unconditional surrender to the Japanese meant that the emperor would be tried as a war criminal and probably hanged. The emperor to the Japanese was effectively a god. General MacArthur's Southwest Pacific Command issued a report in the summer of 1945 in which they said to hang the emperor to them would be like the crucifixion of Christ to us. All would fight to die like ants. The American leaders knew that. In fact, all the American experts kept urging Truman to change the surrender terms, to let the Japanese know that they could keep the emperor. They feared that the Japanese would never surrender if they thought the emperor would be tried as a war criminal. That was the major stumbling block. We know that because we were intercepting these cables, and the cable said that over and over again explicitly. The July 13th cable says, the only obstacles to surrender is the demand for unconditional surrender. Did Truman know that? Yes. 
Truman refers to the intercepted July 18th telegram. These are his words. The telegram from the Jap emperor asking for peace. Those are Truman's words. The telegram from the Jap emperor asking for peace. We were very aware of that. We were very aware that there were two ways to get the Japanese to surrender. One was to change the surrender terms, which everybody pressed on Truman, and Truman refused to go along. His one advisor who urged him not to change the surrender terms was Jimmy Burns. Jimmy Burns becomes Secretary of State on July 3rd. He was Truman's main advisor from the day Truman took over. I mean, Truman was in a difficult position, we have to recognize that. The tragic thing occurred on April 12th. That was the day that Franklin Roosevelt died and Harry Truman became president. Truman should not have been president. And he tells everybody, this is a terrible mistake. I shouldn't be president. The man who should have been president was the man who was vice president before that. That was Henry Wallace. Henry Wallace was a big man. Henry Wallace was a visionary. Henry Wallace was a progressive reformer. Henry Wallace wanted to change the world. In fact, in 1941, when Henry Luce, the head of the Time Life Empire, said that the 20th century must be the American century, Henry Wallace countered that as vice president. He said, no, the 20th century must be the century of the common man. And he calls for a worldwide people's revolution. He said in the tradition of the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Latin American Revolutions, and the Russian Revolution, he says the United States and the Soviets have to work together to reshape the world, to end monopolies and cartels, end economic exploitation, end colonialism, end imperialism. And he was enormously popular. In fact, he was the second most popular man in the United States. On the eve of the Democratic Convention, July 20th, 1944, Gallup released a poll of potential voters in the United States. And they asked potential Democratic voters who they wanted on their ticket as vice president. 65% said they wanted Wallace back as vice president. 2% said they wanted Harry Truman. But it was not very Democratic. And the party bosses controlled the convention. And I won't go into all the details, but had Claude Pepper gotten five, he was five feet from the microphone when they adjourned the session. If Pepper had gotten to the microphone and nominated Wallace that night, he would have swept the convention, been back on the ticket as vice president, become president on April 12th instead of Truman. There would have been no atomic bombing, certainly, and there probably would have been no Cold War. All of history would have been different. But Harry Truman became president. And Truman was a little man, and nobody had any respect for him. One of the astounding things is when he became president, he'd been vice president for 82 days. He had met with Roosevelt twice during that time, and they discussed nothing of substance. When Truman became president, he did not even know that the United States was building an atomic bomb. Nobody had enough respect for Truman to even tell him the United States was building an atomic bomb. Roosevelt thought he would live forever, and that Truman would never become president, but Truman became president. Now he's got to make all these monumental decisions. And he turns to all the wrong people. It's a, it's a very, very sad story. Now Truman, who was not a bad person, was not bloodthirsty, was a little person, a man without vision, unlike Wallace, who had that ability to see the world through the eyes of America's adversaries. He could understand how American actions looked to the Soviets, how they looked to the Brits, how they looked to the rest of the world. Truman had none of that capability. Unfortunately, very few presidents do. So Truman becomes president, and he's got to make, make these decisions. Uh, the United States now has two possibilities. One is the changing the demand for unconditional surrender. The second is the Soviet invasion. The Americans knew because we, the Japanese war cabinet starts staying on, on May 16th and says repeatedly after that the, thing, that the Soviets invade and that will convince all Japanese that defeat is inevitable. If you look at American intelligence planners, the Joint Intelligence Staff to the Joint Chiefs of Staff reports on April 11th, reports several times, says exactly that, that a Soviet invasion of Japan will convince all Japanese that defeat is inevitable. The advice to the Joint Chiefs of Staff at Potsdam, the same thing over and over again. Did Truman know that? Yes. In fact, Truman said he went to Potsdam primarily to make sure that the Soviets were coming into the war. He got the guarantee from Stalin that the Soviets would come into the war. And you have to make a little bit of background on that. At Yalta, Roosevelt got Stalin to agree to come into the war in the Pacific three months after the end of the war in Europe. In exchange for that, the U.S. promised the Soviets would get South Sakhalin, the Kuril Islands, uh, the Port of Darren, Port Arthur, 
the railroad interests in Manchuria, Outer Mongolia would become communist. A lot of things that mostly what the Soviets had lost to the Japanese in the Sino-Japanese War of 1904-1905, the Soviets would get back. They very much wanted that, obviously. So they agreed to come into the Pacific War, which the American military wanted, three months after the end of the war in Europe. Truman goes there, he gets the guarantee from Stalin that he'll come into the war. Truman writes in his diary that night, he says, Stalin will be in the Jap War by August 15th. Finny Japs when that occurs. Those are Truman's words. Finny Japs when the Soviets invade. He writes to his wife Bess the next day, writes her a letter from Potsdam, and says, uh, think of all the boys who won't be killed now. The war will end a year sooner. This is a wonderful, and that's based on the Soviet invasion. So Truman knew that, the people around him knew that. They'd been intercepting the cables. Uh, on the way back from the uh, Potsdam, uh, the USS Augusta, Jimmy Burns' aide writes, Burns, Leahy, and Truman agree, Japs looking for peace. This was very obvious to them, that the Japanese were trying to surrender. We'd intercepted it, we knew the cables, and we, knew, we had that evidence, and Truman had that evidence. So the question is, if Truman is not bloodthirsty, why does he drop the bombs on the Japanese? And why does he begin a process that he knows can possibly end all life on the planet? And I think to make sense out of that, we have to look a little bit at the moral climate in which these decisions were being made. <clears throat> Two factors, I think, are essential for that. Uh, the first one is American attitudes to Japan. American racism was rampant at the time. Uh, the Americans hated the Japanese. Now, it wasn't simply because of racism. The, the, they, the Americans repeatedly referred to the sneak attack at Pearl Harbor and how terrible that was. And then we also got the reports about the Japan Death March. That occurred in 1942, but they get the reports in 1944. They released the information. And this is about the Japanese using American prisoners, tying them to the trees and using them for bayonet practice, dismembering them, castrating them, burying them alive, beheading them. The stuff we see about ISIS today was what the Americans were seeing about the Japanese at the time. So that fed American, American attitudes and hatred of the Japanese. As two-time Pulitzer Prize winning author Alan Nevin says, no foe in American history has been detested the way the Americans hate the Japanese. The British War Office wrote back to London, British War Office in Washington wrote back, said the Americans think of the Japanese as vermin and they want to exterminate the vermin. The leading American war correspondent, Ernie Pyle, uh, was transferred from the Atlantic to the Pacific in 19, early 1942. And he wrote, here in the Atlantic, we thought of the enemy as humans, but in the Pacific, we think of the, the American troops think of the enemy as subhuman, as vermin. The imagery was e either bugs or simian imagery, monkeys and apes. Uh, but certainly Truman would have been racist, right? Harry Truman, in courting his wife, he had a strange way of courting her, wrote a, one letter that I think is classic earlier. He says, I think one man is as good as another as long as he's honest and decent and not a nigger or a Chinaman. Uncle Will says the Lord made a white man of dust, a nigger from mud, that threw up what was left and he came down a Chinaman. He does hate Chinese and Japs, so do I. It is race prejudice, I guess. Uh, Truman referred to, not only to, according to his favorable biographer, Merle Miller, he says, Truman never used any word in private to describe African Americans other than nigger. He referred to the Jews as, as kikes, Japs, I mean, he hate, Truman was a very little man, a very bigoted man. Did that sh influence his decision? We'll never know if that would have influenced his decision, if the Americans would have dropped the bomb equally on Germany. Uh, I think maybe under certain circumstances we would have but we don't, uh, we can never answer that one. So the first thing that lowered America's moral threshold was the racism and the attitude toward the Japanese. And you know, in the United States also, of course, the United States puts 110 to 120,000 Japanese in what were called then concentration camps. These are Japanese Americans. Some were still Japanese citizens because the 1922 uh, Immigration Act, the Japanese were no longer allowed to become citizens in the United States. So these would have mostly all been citizens if they were allowed to be citizens, almost 120,000 put into 10 concentration camps. Uh, the second thing that lowers America's moral threshold is the strategic bombing. The United States, beginning with March 9th and 10th, with the bombing of uh, the city of 
uh, Tokyo, the United States begins flattening Japanese cities. We actually firebombed over 100 Japanese cities. For a long time we thought it was 67. Yuki Tanaka has now shown we firebombed over 100 Japanese cities. The destruction reached 99.5% in the city of Toyama. 99.5%. It wiped out entire cities. The Japanese leaders accepted that the United States could wipe out cities. That was objectionable, perhaps, but it was not something that was going to get them to end the war. The fact that the United States could wipe out cities. Brigadier General Bonner Fellers, who was an aide to MacArthur, said that the American bombing of Japanese cities is, is perhaps the most ruthless annihilation of citizens in the history of warfare. There was tremendous concern about that. Secretary of War Stimson says to Robert Oppenheimer, he says, it's shocking to me that nobody in the United States objects to the fact that we're wiping out Japanese cities. He says we still have to do it, but he says it's shocking. There's something shocking about the fact that nobody would even object to that. And there was the comments by some of the people involved. Uh, I just want to read two of them. Freeman Dyson, <clears throat> the famous physicist, who was with the uh, Tiger Fleet uh, force of 300 British bombers, uh, who was going to bomb Japan, says, I found this continuing slaughter of defenseless Japanese even more sickening than the slaughter of well-defended Germans. But still, I did not quit. So by that time, I had been at war so long I could hardly remember peace. No living poet had words to describe that emptiness of the soul which allowed me to go on killing without hatred and without remorse. But Shakespeare understood it, and he gave Macbeth the words, I am in blood, stepped in so that should I wade no more, returning were as tedious as going over. And Dwight MacDonald, the brilliant critic, wrote in the summer of 1945, he gets some of his numbers wrong, but the point is clear. He says, I remember when Franco's planes bombed Barcelona for the first time. What a thrill of unbelieving horror and indignation went through our nerves at the idea of hundreds, yes, hundreds of civilians being killed. It seems impossible that that was less than 10 years ago. Franco's Air Force was a toy compared to the sky-filling bombing fleets destroyed in the, deployed in this war. And the hundreds killed in Barcelona have become the thousands killed in Rotterdam and Warsaw, the tens of thousands in Hamburg and Cologne, the hundreds of thousands in Dresden, and the millions in Tokyo. A month ago, the papers reported that over one million Japanese men, women, and children have perished in the fires set by a single B-29 raid on Tokyo. One million. I saw no expression of horror or indignation in any American newspaper or magazine of sizable circulation. We've grown catalyst to massacre, and the concept of guilt has spread to include whole populations. Our hearts are hardened, our nerves steady, our imagination under control as we read the morning paper. King Mithridates is said to have immunized himself against poison by taking small doses, which he increased slowly. So the gradually increasing horrors of the last decade has made each of us, to some extent, a moral Mithridates, immunized against human sympathy. And I think the two of them really capture it. So the United States, uh, which is not a bloodthirsty nation, was doing things that were horrific and bloodthirsty even before the atomic bombings. And that's that lowering of the moral threshold allows somebody like Truman to go ahead and do this when there was no military necessity and there was no justification, certainly for an, in, a, in a moral sense. Did anybody try to object to this? Yes. Uh, the scientists at MetLab in Chicago formed a series of committees. The main one was the Frank Committee. A lot of top scientists were part of that. They issued a report in June saying, even if the United States has the bomb ready, we should not use it. It says, using it will not only destroy our moral credibility in the world, it will trigger an arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union that will lead to mutual <coughs> destruction and annihilation. They circulated that. 155 scientists signed it. The American authorities uh, classified it. Then Leo Szilard, the great Hungarian physicist, wrote up his own uh, statement. That was, signed, that was the one that was signed by 155 scientists. And he said, we're opening the door to an era of unimaginable destruction. He said, there is no limit to the size of these weapons. And that was the reality. And people understood that. In fact, Robert Oppenheimer 
briefed the interim committee, the scientists of the people, the military advisors who were supposed to make the decision on May 31st, and he said that within three years, we will probably have weapons between 100 and 10,000, between 100 and 1,000 megatons. Which means that he said within three years we're going to have weapons 7,000 times as powerful as the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. He told the top, top advisors, the top planners that they knew this. They went into this with their eyes open. Did Truman know that? What did Truman know? Truman gets his first briefing on the bomb, real briefing, on April 3rd, his first 13th, his first day in office, from Jimmy Burns, who flies up from South Carolina to give him the briefing. And Truman writes in his memoir, he says, uh, Burns said, this, we have a weapon great enough to destroy the whole world. He says, it may, give us our, it may give us the ability to dictate our own terms at the end of the war. He doesn't say a bigger bomb, a more powerful bomb. He says, a weapon great enough to destroy the whole world. And that's what he understood it to be. After he gets a full briefing on April 25th from Groves and Stimson, uh, he, he says that Groves and Stimson says, we shouldn't, maybe we shouldn't use it even if we have it because it could destroy the whole world. And Truman says, and I agreed with him, that this is something that could destroy the whole world. When Truman's in Potsdam and he gets a full briefing about how powerful the bomb test was in Alamogordo on July 16th, Truman writes in his memoir, he says, we have found the most destructive weapon ever. He says, it may be the fire destruction prophecy in the Euphrates Valley era after Noah and his fabulous ark. Not in a, a bigger bomb, the fire destruction. He's talking about the end of the world. Truman knew this on some primordial level that this was what he, what he was unleashing on the world. But other people objected also. In fact, America's military leaders were by and large unanimously opposed to the use of the bomb. Six of America's seven five-star admirals and generals who got their fifth star during the war are on record as saying the bomb was either militarily unnecessary or morally reprehensible or both. Uh, Admiral Leahy. Admiral Leahy was Truman's chief of staff. He was Truman's personal military advisor and he chaired the meetings of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Leahy wrote, uh, Jap the Japanese were already defeated and ready to surrender. The use of this barbarous weapon at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was of no material assistance in our war against Japan. And being the first to use it, we adopted an ethical standard common to the barbarians of the Dark Ages. I was not taught to make war in that fashion, and wars cannot be won by destroying women and children. He said it was a violation of every Christian ethic I've ever heard of and all of the known laws of war. He put it in the category with chemical and bacterial biological weapons and said it was the worst thing that had ever been done. He had later told Truman's biographer, Jonathan Daniels, who interviewed him in 1949, said Truman told me it was agreed that they would use it only to hit military objectives. Of course, then they went ahead and killed as many women and children as they could, which was just what they wanted all the time. Uh, Leslie Groves, who was the head of the Manhattan Project, General Leslie Groves, said, I had to go behind the backs of the Joint Chiefs of Staff because of Leahy's known opposition to the bomb. But it wasn't just Leahy, also President Eisenhower, then he was General Eisenhower. Eisenhower got briefed on the bomb. He said that he was told at Potsdam, he said he went and he confronted Truman in Berlin and told Truman not to use the bomb. We don't know if that's true. There is no meet, record of that meeting. But Eisenhower told Stephen Ambrose, a biographer, that he directly told Truman not to use the bomb. But Eisenhower, and, and it's really ironic in the sense because Eisenhower is more responsible for the military industrial complex that he warned about than any other president. When Eisenhower takes office in 1953, the United States has a little more than 1,000 nuclear bombs. When Eisenhower leaves office, the United States has 23,000 nuclear bombs. When Eisenhower's budgeting cycle is finished, the United States has 30,000 nuclear bombs. So Eisenhower really is the one who fits that description of, that Mumford says about madmen running things. When Eisenhower takes office, our nuclear bombs were our last resort. When he leaves office, they're our first resort. When he takes office, we've got one finger on the nuclear bomb. When he leaves office, we, we've got dozens of fingers on the nuclear bomb because of his subdelegation and his delegation. Eisenhower leaves his, his PSYOP, 
to his successor. And according to that psyop, the United States expected that America, the plan was in, in, in a war with Russia, it would go immediately toward nuclear, and we would use everything we had at once. The Joint Chiefs of Staff calculated that would lead to 625 to 650 million deaths from U.S. weapons alone. We're talking about 100 holocausts. Was the American war plan at that point? This is Eisenhower. But Eisen, even Eisenhower had the decency to know that the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was unconscionable. He later reports in exchange with Simpson. He says, Then Simpson told me they were going to drop it on the Japanese. Well, I learned, I listened, I didn't volunteer anything because after all, my war was over in Europe and it wasn't up to me. But I was getting more and more depressed just thinking about it. Then he asked me for my opinion. So I told him I was against it on two counts. First, the Japanese were ready to surrender, and it wasn't necessary to hit them with that awful thing. Second, I hated to see our country be the first to use such a weapon. Douglas MacArthur, the same Douglas MacArthur who was so desperate to drop atomic bombs in Korea, MacArthur who was the farthest thing possible from a pacifist, MacArthur was horrified we used the bomb. He, said, he gave a briefing on August 6th before the bomb was dropped, and he told the press there, said, I'm terrified about the next war, which is going to be 10,000 times more destructive than this one. And he, he exchanged letters with former President Herbert Hoover. Hoover had sent a memo to Truman telling him to change the surrender terms in May. And uh, uh, MacArthur writes to Truman, he says, uh, it was a wise and statesmanlike document, and had it been put into effect, it would have uh, obviated the slaughter at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So that the Japanese would have accepted it, and gladly, I have no doubt. So MacArthur, in charge of the Southwest Pacific Command, says the Japanese would have surrendered in May if we had told them they could keep the emperor. Even I don't think they would have surrendered that early. But I think in June, possibly, and certainly in July, had they known. But th had they known that also that the Soviets were coming into the war, that we had this weapon that we were going to use, and that the Soviets, and that, that they could keep the emperor. In fact, when, they, when Stalin went to Potsdam, he brought his own version of the Potsdam Declaration. But Truman did not let him sign the Potsdam Declaration. Had tri Stalin signed it, then the, Soviet, then the Japanese would have known that the Soviets were about to come into the war. Truman wanted to use the bomb, and that's the sad truth to it. At Potsdam, Truman gets the briefing. Churchill says, I couldn't understand it. He came into the meeting with Stalin, and he was a changed man. All of a sudden, he told Stalin where to get on and where to get off, and he bossed the entire meeting. For Truman, the bomb was something, a weapon to use against the Soviets. We often say that the United States has only used two atomic bombs. As my friend Dan Ellsberg says quite correctly, that the United States has used atomic bombs repeatedly in the same sense that a, man, a robber holding a gun to someone's head uses that bomb without pulling the trigger use that gun without pulling the trigger. The United States has made nuclear threats over and over again. The United States thought we could get our way with the Soviets once we demonstrated the bomb. We could get our way in Europe, we could get our way in Asia. We know this from a number of ways. Leslie Groves, head of the Manhattan Project, says, from two weeks after the time I took over this project, I, didn't, I knew that the Russia was the enemy, Russia was the target. I didn't think of them as gallant heroes like most Americans did. When Szilard and Yuri went down to meet with Jimmy Burns, they went to meet with Truman, they met with Burns instead because Truman sent him down to South Carolina. And Burns says to Szilard, Szilard says, we can't use this bomb. It's terrible. We should never use it. And Burns says, you're Hungarian, aren't you? Don't you want to get the, Euro the Russians out of Hungary? Don't you want to get them out of Europe? We know this over and over again, that evidence. That was the thinking. And how was the bomb interpreted by the Soviets? Exactly that way because the Japanese had decided that their best chance for getting better surrender terms was to get the Soviets to negotiate on their, their behalf. They made an offer to the Soviets, similar to what the Americans were offering, and they, they, and they met with the Soviets. The uh, Hirota, the former prime minister, met with the Soviet ambassador Malik in Tokyo on several occasions in, in June, and based on which Malik reported back to the Kremlin, the Japanese are desperate to surrender. The Soviets knew that. The Soviets knew that better than anybody, how desperate the Japanese were. When the Americans dropped the bomb on Hiroshima on August 6th and Nagasaki on August 9th, it's the Soviets interpret that directly as they were the target. And in truth, they really were the target. There was no military excuse for dropping it on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So we drop it on Hiroshima August 6th. 
the 140,000 dead by the end of the year, 200,000 dead by 1950. We dropped it on, on Nagasaki August 9th. 70,000 dead by the end of the year, 140,000 dead by 1950. But that doesn't make the Japanese surrender. What forces the Japanese to surrender is, as we knew, the Soviet invasion. As Prime Minister, Soviet Prime Minister Suzuki, I mean, the Japanese Prime Minister Suzuki says on August 11th, said, we have to surrender now, we have to surrender to the Americans. The Japanese will, the Soviets are, are already in uh, Sakhalin, the Kuril Islands, they'll be in, uh, in, in Korea, they'll be in Hokkaido tomorrow, all of Japan will be destroyed. We knew that the Japanese military leaders say that over and over again when they were interrogated. That, that it was the Soviet invasion. Because the Japanese leaders, the Japanese leaders, it didn't make a big difference whether it was 200 planes and thousands of bombs or one plane and one bomb. They already accepted that the, that the Americans could wipe out Japanese cities. That was something they could accept. But the Soviet invasion undermined both their uh, diplomatic strategy to get the Soviets to intervene on their behalf and their military strategy, the catch-and-go military strategy, which called for uh, inflicting heavy casualties on the Americans if they invaded. But the Americans would never have invaded. As Admiral Leahy says, I could never see any reason from a national defense point of view for an American invasion of a thoroughly defeated Japan. Once the Americans had the bomb, the choice was between changing the surrender terms and, and negotiating, or dropping the bomb. The invasion was off, off the books. But that's the mythology. That's what Americans learn. That's what much of the rest of the world learns, that somehow this was a noble thing that the United States did. And to make it even worse, the Americans told the Japanese they can keep the emperor. In fact, the American leaders knew all along they were going to let the Japanese keep the emperor, and that was their only way to secure stability and safeguard the peace, was to keep the emperor in order to maintain stability there. So the United States drops the bombs, begins the nuclear age, in just the way that Truman was warned was the most dangerous way possible, dropped in a way that the Soviets actually did interpret it, that they were the target, and then the arms race begins. And then we get to 70,000 nuclear weapons, 1.47 million Hiroshima bombs equivalent, and if I had time today, I would talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis, I would talk about a lot of other things, the things we're learning on a daily basis about what actually happened during the Cuban Missile Crisis, how much closer we came to annihilation than we figured, and, and the danger still of these kinds of weapons in leaders who are not unlike Harry Truman, leaders with little vision, limited morality, and little sense of looking for alternatives or understanding how the situation looks to the other side. Just look at the situation in Ukraine. The United States and the Russians still have thousands of nuclear weapons pointed at each other on hair trigger alert. You know, the insanity has not ended. We've lived with 70 years of insanity, and we're lucky to have survived those 70 years, or many times we survived just by pure dumb luck, not by statesmanship. So that's the bleak uh, report that I have to give you today. But if the more we understand about this, the more we're prepared to make changes and to try to bring wisdom to these statesmen and to convince them that this path is one of destruction. Thank you. Stoner and I did this documentary. Episode 3, which if I had time I would have shown you our episode 3, but I didn't have an hour to do that. 
it goes into great detail about this, and it's incredibly powerful. And Oliver Stone and I go all around the world uh, and talk about these topics. That's the episode we usually show. So we put out uh, Untold History, uh, the 12-part documentary film series, which is available everywhere. Uh, and now we're getting it into the high schools, we're getting it into the middle schools. We just put out a middle school book. Of four we have four volumes of the middle school version of the Untold History of the United States <coughs> to 10 to 16-year-olds. We're getting that from middle schools and high schools. It's, uh, the first volume just came out, and that goes into this. It's also coming out in Japanese and, and, and England and other places. The book is out in about 16, 17 languages. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. And we try to get this debate going every place we can. So I, 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 do, I do a lot, a lot of speaking about this. And I'm happy to go anywhere to, to talk about this. I debate people on it. It's, um, it. I think it's such a clear cut case. I didn't go through, that's why my students go sit for 12 hours because I've got so many more quotes and evidence and documentation on this is very, very pervasive. But we have to get this out because if people don't know, understand the past, they, the danger really is much greater that they'll repeat it. And also, our argument is that people's, everybody has a view of history. And people are guided in their politics and the present and their attitude about the future by their understanding of history. And, and it, it sort of constrains their ability to think. They only understand, they think that what happened now is inevitable that what exists now in the world could not have been different, then they can't imagine a different future. And that's one of the problems we run into, is that young people can't imagine how much better the world could be and should be, how different the world could be and should be. They think that what we have now is the only way it could have been. So I think we have to challenge that. We have to show them how close we've come repeatedly in our history of having much, much better outcomes, and how sometimes the worst has been avoided. In a nutshell, that was the answer to education. We really need to do much more to educate the future decision makers in all of our countries. But I think um, this is an excellent introduction to, uh, to the topic, and it also will put the scene into what we are about to, uh, to see now. I think uh, horrific as the atomic bomb was in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there were survivors. There were survivors. We are going to hear from some of those survivors now. If it was a nuclear bomb, with the definition that was provided here, there would be no survivors. I think the only thing that the nuclear bomb can actually offer is assured perishability. And I think the message there that the nuclear possessor countries are given to the world is that people are expendable. You know, they don't really care. So I think uh, this is a very good uh, way in which we can uh, see um, our negative the Darlington video. We're going to see a video. This video arrived for us yesterday from Singapore. And it is testimony on the atomic bomb attack on Hiroshima. Um, we will hear from Mr. Hori, uh, So Hori. Uh, we will also hear from Steve Lipa, the former chairman of the Hiroshima Peace Culture Foundation, and from Mr. Akira Kawasaki, director of the Ibakusha project of the Peace Project. The video was made by documentary maker Emma Bagot during the Peace Boat's passage from Kobe, Japan to Singapore. And it was sent to us yesterday from Singapore. So we will see it in a short video um, and then we will, uh, we will continue with the second part of this. Something big happened when I saw very bright flash and the next come up and a faint blast of window with big sound. Uh, I was a uh, house a uh, feature was away 100 meters from my house, but only time I saw such a thing. to my house, my mother treated them, but all of them could not live long time. One woman passed away in my house. I couldn't do anything because I was too young. I was only five years old. The question of uh, how do we deal with 
a world without nuclear weapons is one that's raised a lot. And the people, many people who defend nuclear weapons said, well, uh, I hate uh, the world with nuclear weapons, but it's better than a world without nuclear weapons. And what they're implying is that nuclear weapons are keeping the peace through deterrence, so that nuclear weapons have somehow kept Russia or the Soviet Union from going to war with the United States for all these years, and therefore they are peacekeepers, and actually they have been called peacekeepers by some people. Uh, my father worked at his office, uh, which was very near Hype Center. He passed away uh, six days later. My elder sister passed away with colon cancer with, uh, when she was uh, 55 years old. My brother passed away with liver cancer when uh, he was uh, 63 years old. So I was his project uh, is a project where uh, Japanese Hibakusha, the Hiroshima Nagasaki survivors, are meeting with young children and also their parents in many countries around the world. I know some people don't want to see horror. Uh, I was her head project will help with this. I believe it will make uh, the atomic bomb disaster more uh, related to, to society today. Yeah, the idea is that um, if you have an 80-year-old Hibaksha and he comes in and he talks from Japan and he comes to Europe, and he talks about what happened in Hiroshima. There's this strong, there's a big distance. You know, he's 80 years old, he's Japanese. This bomb happened a long time ago. It's this big distance between what happened and what's happening now. But if that 80 year old man meets a 40 year old father and a, a 10 year old son, and they are talking and he says, you know, when that A-bomb fell in Hiroshima, I was exactly your age, he says to the child. That has a psychological impact. It really, it creates a bond in a way. There's always, you know, weapons issue is, uh, uh, is talked in a way that the uh, U.S. dropped on Japan, or U.S. and Russia are com competing. Always, uh, the country's names are the basis of the discussion, but we really want to personalize it. Uh, I'm looking forward to meeting April because uh, first use of poison gas is similar to the first use of nuclear weapon in Hiroshima. I want to know more about it. Ipper has been a tremendous help to Mayors for Peace, and Mayors for Peace is the campaigning arm of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, to a large extent, that going there is saying thank you, and also recognizing the fact that they are celebrating 100 years since their great poison gas attack, the poison gas attack that destroyed that city. There are some natural-made and environmental-made crises from which many people living things uh, cannot escape. Uh, but we can prevent a nuclear winter and drastic fallout from a nuclear accident. Even my country, Japan, is relying on nuclear weapons in a military doctrine and also in the mindset. People are thinking, and at least the government is thinking, that nuclear weapons will bring about peace and security, which is quite opposite. Uh, to the message that uh, Hibakshas are uh, talking to the world. So we have double face. You know, this double standard is a really serious matter. So I, we Peace Vote is trying to talk to the people around the world that our voice, Hibakshas' voice, and the hi citizens' voice, are the real voice of Japan. Oh my God. The role of the peace boat in our nuclear campaign is, is an effort to do two things. One of them is that it does take the hibaksha 
and the Japanese people who are against nuclear weapons all around the world and exposing people in all the ports of call to these, these people. And, and they are raising this issue. There are people all around the world now who are aware of this problem. Many, many more than 10 years ago. I have many things uh, to do every day on the peace board. I can speak my opinion about peace for many people. I uh, can sing a song, can play, dance, so I am very happy now. to say a few more words about the I Was the Age project of Mayors for Peace and Peace Corps. Right? Hello. Uh, you may have seen the smaller versions of this poster uh, on display back there. Um, this is a joint project of Mayors for Peace and Peace Vote. It uh, started a while back, but the vote itself left uh, uh, Japan on the 12th of April and will be it traveling around the world for 113 days, getting back to Japan uh, just a couple of weeks before the 70th anniversaries. Um, it can be fairly isolated on a boat when you're out at sea and you've lost uh, telecommunication contacts with the land. And we have a social media campaign um, on Facebook primarily, uh, which you can get the information from if you look at the posters uh, that are out there. And we're trying to connect um, uh, with the peace boat and to show solidarity with the peace boat as it goes and encouraging people uh, to uh, express that solidarity and ultimately to hold 70th anniversaries in their cities and communities. By the time the boat sailed, we had 1,000 followers on uh, Facebook. Uh, and we're now over 1,100, and we're aiming to have 2,000 by the time we reach, uh, the boat reaches Europe. Um, we don't know how big it can get, but we would like to ask all of you to take part. It's going to be an extraordinary journey. We call it a journey to the heart of the world. And um, we have these fabulous posters. There's a story that goes with the posters. I won't tell it right now, but you've got a hint of it from what Steve Lieber said. Um, and one of the social, um, by the way, that, that is Mr. Hiroe there. We took that picture over a year ago. Uh, this is a father and son in the group where the boy is about the same age and he's telling the father it's his age. Um, so uh, we have a solidarity activity that I would like to invite you to take part in. Um, it's called uh, Bon Voyage child survivors. And what we do, uh, is someone ready with the camera and so on? Okay, thank you, Alan. I should come up here where you can see the audience. Um, uh, what we do is simply wave and holler out bon voyage uh, as enthusiastically as we know how. And that will be put up on the uh, website, um, and they'll be able to look at it as soon as they get into contact with land again. And that will give them a good feeling, and it will inspire other people to do the same. So please join me in waving, Bon voyage! Bon voyage! Thank you very, very much. <laughs> see what other activities are being generated, and stick with us until the 70th, because we talked about the importance of outreach. We're using this as a vehicle for getting out the kind of information that Mr. Kuznick, Professor Kuznick, was uh, providing. Uh, the nature of the threat, which Lars will be talking about uh, very soon, and so on. So it's, it's, a, um, it's called an educational project.
speaker of the morning session should talk about the impact of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Um, and we really are honored uh, to have with us Mr. Yasu Yasuyoshi Komiso, who is the Secretary General of the Mayors for Peace campaign. The Mayors for Peace network is rapidly approaching 6,000 cities in 158 countries. My own city, Buenos Aires, is a member of this network, and I'm very proud of that. Its goal includes the promotion of the abolition of nuclear weapons by the year 2020, including a nuclear weapons convention. And it might interest you to know that in the last three uh, weeks, we've had very good session uh, at the United Nations called by the Holy See, in which uh, seven religions took place, the, the, the highest members uh, of uh, those uh, religions, and they were able to prove that according to the Quran, according to the Torah, according to the Bible, uh, on all of them, a uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear uh, weapon, uh, nuclear destruction uh, is entirely against their religious uh, beliefs. So um, we must also push into this direction and they're also calling for the nuclear prohibition on the nuclear weapons convention. So I have the honor to invite Mr. Yasuyoshi, Commissioner to the floor. I suppose everyone is hungry, so I think I'm trying to uh, be uh, briefer than, than I uh, prepared. But anyway, uh, I think it is a very, very important uh, fact i like to share with you. And, uh, let me start. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, for uh, giving me a chance to speak at this important conference on the occasion of a 100-year commemoration of the first mass use of gas during World War I. On behalf of the city of Hiroshima and in my capacity as Secretary General of the Mayor for Peace, I would like first of all to humbly offer a most sincere prayer to every soul of the gas attack victims and their surviving family members, as well as all other victims of modern warfare. I would also like to express a strong sense of solidarity in our common efforts to create lasting world peace. And today I was, I, I'm asked to speak about the impact of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. The, at the outset, uh, I, let me say that we truly value and are thankful for the consistent efforts of Hibakusha, the atomic bomb survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, testifying their unbearable tra tragic experiences with a profound humanitarian message that no one shall ever again suffer as we have to prevent the use of nuclear weapons and to abolish them. This is also the reason why mayors of, mayors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki took initiatives to establish Mayors for Peace in 1982 and at present more than 6,600, actually right at the beginning of April, it was 6,649 uh, mayors in 160 countries and regions have become members with total population of 1 million citizens and still many more cities are consist, consist, constantly joining us. Actually every month about 50 to 60 mayors join. Well, uh, before I start, uh, I'd like to show you the uh, 
picture taken before the atomic bomb. And this central part is actually the, currently the peace part. So this is most busiest part of the civilian activities. About 4,400 people live in that small area. All finished. And uh, this is the uh, uh, atomic bomb dome before and after. Actually, this was the uh, uh, Prefecture Industrial Promotion Hall, one of the most building, beautiful buildings around this area, designed by Jan Lutzow, Czech architect. And uh, I'm going to talk about this one. But if you look at this, at the time of the bombing, about 8,300 junior high school boys and girls were mobilized to make fire breaks to avoid the fire to spread in the case of the ordinary areas. And those children of age 11 to 13, 6,300 boys and girls died. Actually, the uh, August 6th is, of course, the heat of the summer. And it was a clear day, no, no clouds almost. At around 8.15 a.m., U.S. bomber, Enra Gay, dropped a bomb which contained around 50 kilograms of enriched uranium divided into two pieces. At around 9,600 meters above the densely populated city and departed. 43 seconds later, at around 600 meters above ground, most effective destructive point, the, one of the pieces of enriched uranium was shot into another to create a critical mass. Only one kilogram, one kilogram actually, if you put them together, this heavy metal, it's about the size of the golf ball. This only one kilogram of enriched uranium went through fission and it took only one millionth of a second. 16 kilotons of its destructive power was released. Radiation near the speed of light immediately attacked Hiroshima. It exceeded 60 times that of 100% lethal dose near the hypocenter. The bomb with extreme heat and energy exploded and evaporated. It formed a huge fireball of more than a million degrees Celsius at this core and released a massive shockwave and heat wave that destroyed people and structures without mercy. At the hypocenter, surface temperature of the ground rose up to 3,000 to 4,000 degrees Celsius. The 160,000 degrees Celsius is a point I am melt, so much, much severe heat. And the power blast was 440 meters per second. And three minutes later, it was a clear sky, but three minutes later, the mushroom clouds arose visible to the eyes of the people. But actually, this contained all debris and everything with radioactivity. And 20 minutes later, black rain started to pour to contaminate much wider area with radioactivity. Induced fires broke out everywhere and burned people alive. Many people who didn't die instantly were trapped by the fallen down buildings and others. They couldn't run away, so they were burned alive. And I think you saw that already. And uh, Hiroshima became ruins. On that day, some tens of thousands of people lost their lives. We don't know the exact figure, but um, according to the estimate by the city of Hiroshima, by the end of the year, around 140,000 precious lives were lost. If you look at these statistics, it's uh, 1944, about 336,000 people were there, and in 1945, statistics shows 137,000 people. But that actually shows 
meaningful diet. And countless scorched corpses, throng of people with whole body burns, fleeing from the city, the dying young boys and girls pleading for water, mothers holding their dead children on the side of the road, the lives of many infants, young boys and girls, women and the elderly, innocent civilians who should be protected during times of war were sacrificed. Actually, out of the uh, 350,000 people, the military personnel was only 30,000, less than 10%. So actually, more than 90% were children, women, and elderly. Those are the big things. But these sacrificed victims have dreams and hopes for the future and lives filled with the love of their families. The atomic bomb destroyed all of this in one moment. Even those who barely managed to escape death continued to suffer, traumatized by the fact that they could not save their families and friends and burdened with helplessly cruel living conditions after the war with long-term radiation effects and social discrimination because people didn't know this could be a contagious disease and normal parents don't want this disfigurated and severe possibly contaminated disease holders cannot be their children's patterns so they had very very difficult time even to get married or even to work that I just said the social discrimination and even 70 years now, the survivors are even now going through serious health concerns. There are intensive health cares, and there are still survivors. And they are still going through cancers and leukemia caused by the radiation, and not only for themselves, but also for, for their offspring. The scientists differ, but actually there are indications, and therefore the parents victims have dear serious concern for the children. Now let me describe Avon damages in more detail. The damage inflicted at the atomic bomb was characterized by instant and massive destruction, indiscriminate mass slaughter and radiation. Radiation damage led to decays of human suffering and I'm going through different aspects of damages. I think I'll just cut it short, but uh, this is actually, uh, I'm, I'm showing that uh, some of the scenes after the bombing. And about uh, two kilometers in radius, uh, uh, all burned out, and uh, people are in there actually. And first, I'd like to talk about, uh, uh, this is actually black rain, a trace of black rain. First, I'd like to talk about effects of heat rays. By the way, this is the uh, picture drawn by Goro Shikoku. And uh, this is a very famous uh, kind of steps in front of one of the commercial banks, about 260 meters from the hypercenter, it's Sumitomo Banks. It's 8.15, bank opened at 8.30. Somebody was waiting there. And this is after waiting there and because of the flash, the trace of black kind of things are there, it's visible still. It's cut off and you can see that in our museum. And actually uh, current director of the museum also about uh, our age and uh, he was waiting uh, before he goes to school for the city trams. And uh, this is something. And this is the effect of the heat ray. The heat ray, by the way, only lasted about two to three seconds only. Extreme heat, but only two to three seconds. And uh, this one is about one kilometer from the hypocenter, the burned by heat rays. And this part is preserved because of the instant heat. It doesn't, the white, he has white belt. And uh, that, <coughs> That say that part actually it's a strange phenomenon. But this lady was imprinted the uh, 
type of the uh, kimono uh, when she was wearing at the time of the bombing. And I, I think that probably stop, skip the blast. The blast actually, I, I only talk about the uh, effects. The approximately 10 seconds after detonation, the shock wave had traveled 3.7 kilometers. The pressure was immense, 19 tons per square meter, as far away as 100, 500 meters from the high percentage. 19 tons per square meter. When the blast subsided, the air density in the center area was extremely low. It's a vacuum, created vacuum. So the, another one comes back and attacked it. And uh, in the area from the hypercenter out to uh, two kilometers radius, wooden structure was mostly destroyed and so on. And also the glasses were shattered and people got the shattered glasses all over their body if they are here near to the broken glasses. And now I think I, let me skip to radiation. And of course, in, in the hypercenter, it's combination of three effects, the radiation, the heat rays, and blast. But th this person didn't have any injuries. And the high enough dose which did, were not fatal created purple spots and within a few days. And actually, when the people develop purple, purple spots, that actually indicates their body, internal organs were rotten. And they kept dying. With those people who had any out injuries also kept dying. So this is really, really scary kind of death. And it's really, really painful death. They are not dying instant, but they were going through agony and pains and with you know, margot and everything. And even those survived, they got long-term effects. The most visible one is the kind of uh, this uh, uh, type of the scars, uh, carrots. And since the damage is very deep into the, into the tissues, even if you cut off by surgery, it comes out again. So uh, there is one example, the 60 times surgery to take off those scars and coming back and back and back again. And now, I think I'd probably like to talk about black brains. And uh, this picture, this is uh, taken from uh, one of the uh, walls uh, about a kilometer from the hypercenter. And it's preserved in, in, in our museum. And this has a trace of blood grains. And the, those blood grains produced by the big mushroom clouds contaminate much, much wider area. 